Hello, and welcome to Better Than Art School. This is a lecture about composition and how to use Gestalt psychology principles to better your composition. Okay, maybe you've seen this before, this illusion. Um, so you can either see this as the front. So try to see it like this, where this is the front plane of the, the square for a second. And now kind of unhook your eyes, unshift your eyes. Now see this as the front plane. Okay, so that is called a gestalt shift. You're seeing the entire figure, the entire box in two totally different ways. Okay, this one, it's pointing downward. This is the front plane. This one is pointing upward, and this is the top plane. These are photographs that, that give you pause for a second because for a second there, it looks like this woman has a very, you know, foot-looking head. But actually, her head's just kicked back, and that's her back leg kicking out. This one, there's a shadow of a flag here, but it looks like she's, you know, Aladdin's sister or something. She's floating above the ground for a second. So these are gestalt shifts that happen in ambiguous photographs. When we, when we don't quite understand what's going on, our visual apparatus acts to make sense of the situation. And this one, for most people, it's going to be the wrong idea because it just so happens that this kind of fits right under this and this microphone looks like it's being shadowed here. So, all right, so that gives you a little hint of what Gestalt is. So Gestalt is, it was a school of psychology in Germany and it means unified whole. That's what the word Gestalt means. It means seeing things in a unified way. How do you unify what you're seeing? And it refers to these visual perception uh, ideas of psychology developed by German psychologists in the 1920s. And they, they try to talk about how we organize visual information. How do we make sense of the visual world as we see it? How do we go from place to place and figure out what's going on based on scant visual information? How do we come to an idea about the whole situation from fragmented parts? Okay, so you might ask, well, okay, that's interesting, but how do artists use it today? Because this is a long time from 1920. But these, a lot of these have been bolstered by subsequent uh, schools of psychology, like evolutionary psychology, for instance, has come to some of the same conclusions. Um, and then some things have been, you know, challenged. But I think for artists, a lot of these things will help your composition if you just kind of take them on board. So these are some gestalt or uh, organizational principles for visual information. How do you organize visual information? And different Gestalt psychologists and different art teachers have had have listed these differently, but this is a common usage just to break it down into six. So grouping, and I'll talk about each one of these in turn, containment, repetition, proximity, continuity, and closure. You probably know most of these words or you've heard most of these words, and I, I'll try to spell out what they mean in a more specific visual gestalt context. I said, okay, so grouping. I'm gonna get myself out of the way. Myself. Okay, so grouping. So this is kind of this room this is a Degas painting. It's grouped into there's there's succinct groups of ballerinas. Otherwise, it should be a chaos of ballerinas. So there's this group going downstairs, this group in the foreground, group in the middle ground, group in the background. These groupings make the space understandable. It makes you be able to parse the space, to be able to move through the space. You can think even like words uh, or a form of grouping, or paragraphs or a form of grouping that's chunking. It's also called chunking, where you put together information in a way that makes sense. If I just read off to you a bunch of random letters and asked you to give them back to me, like nine letters, it'd be really hard for you. But if I spelled out a word, and I just asked you what the word was, you could easily give it back to me. So grouping helps you make sense of the visual world by putting things into grouping things together that way, putting things together so that we can see space in between them and so we can understand them as succinct groups. Okay, so we typically group by location. Maybe I should put myself there. Okay, so obviously these two are going to look like they're together and these two are going to look like they're together. Orientation. So these, even though this one's closer to this one than this one, they this one you would group with these two because it's they're all pointing the same direction. So that's orientation. Shape, for heaven's sakes. 
Um, the triangles seem to go together and the ovals seem to go together. Color, I just put it there. So these kind of link together because they're red and these two link together because they're green. Okay, so these are just some common ways that people group visual units. Okay, so that's a little bit about grouping. Grouping, I think, is the simplest of these principles to understand. The second one is containment. What is the border that we put around something? What is the the outer limits of something, and how do we acknowledge that? So she's wearing, this is a Van Gogh painting, she's wearing a hat and a backpack with the same image on it, but it's just contained in very different shapes, forms. All right, so containment is a unifying force created by the outer edge of the composition or a boundary within the composition. So if you go to Rome and you go and you look at the cathedrals, there's no frames. It's just everything's exploding out everywhere. The, the art is just everywhere. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But what happened is in the Netherlands, uh, more and more middle class people wanted to buy artwork. So this idea kind of rose up early that you would have a frame and it was kind of like a faux windowsill. So you would have all these landscape paintings and it was like you're looking through this frame uh, or it's like a window frame and you're looking out into a space, right? And this was maybe even more successful than the people ever thought it would be because if you put a frame around something, we'll just watch it. And it's like it's giving it special focus. It's giving it a bounded world and we can just enter into that world and get sucked into it and the screens you know they keep getting smaller and smaller and we're still up for it we're still into it we still want to look we'll still watch a show on our phones okay so this is an example in art this is a artist named gata amir and what she's doing here so she's using a couch probably from a um, thrift store or something and then using it as a frame for her her sewing art, her textile art. Here's another example. This is a sculptor named Ron Muick, and he's sculpting an enormous newborn baby. And the plinth underneath, that, that white um, structure underneath, is acts like a frame. Okay, repetition. This is a painting by Odd Nerdrum. And this is the same figure over and over again, kind of making this L shape, uh, this kind of corner shape, whatever it is. And then you see the same clouds repeating, you see the sticks on the ground repeating. So a lot of repetition in here. Okay, when the same or similar visual element or effect is employed over and over and over again. Okay, and it's kind of connected to rhythm a little bit. If basically, if everything in a picture is totally separate, it, it becomes kind of chaotic. But if we have the same thing happening again and again, we can kind of catch on to it. And then we see it move through different kind of phases. That's continuity, which I'll talk about in a second. But repetition is basically just using the same thing over and over again. So this is an example. This is a, a cake made of icing, uh, sheets that are arranged. Okay, this is kind of a subtle form. If you just look at the way that the, I couldn't find the artist's name for this one, but you can kind of see this flowing brook of water, and it's got this repetition. It's kind of coming out. It sets this kind of nice diagonal move through the whole picture. Okay, so proximity. This is from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. This is God and Adam almost touching. But there's a slight distance between God and man. There's a slight distance between the divine and the human, the divine and the worldly. Okay, so proximity is manipulating the distance between visual elements, okay? It basically, a way to think about this is you wanna call attention to the space between something, okay? not the things themselves. You're trying to make the space in between the focus. And through proximity, we can, we can figure out if something is one figure or multiple figures. So the squares up here feel like they're separated from each other. So the proximity um, is becoming dispersed and they're becoming individual units. Whereas down here, the squares are all the same distance. It's a very close distance. So the proximity kind of pulls them together. So that's another way to think about proximity. This is closer to what I said the first time about proximity, where you're trying to focus on the distance. This is Arshiel Gorky. This is a painting of him and his mother together. And the space between becomes very interesting, very, very um, interesting shape, just to look at, just as a, purely as a shape. 
but also just is what it might say about him and his mother's relationship. Okay, continuity. That's a fluid connection among compositional parts. Okay, so these are different kinds of continuity. I put myself. Okay, and this one, the, ob the same stamp or whatever this thing is, is just moving through space. The second one, it's moving through space, but the the ordering changes, the way it's put together. In this one, the line work is changing, so a formal element like line is changing. In this one, it's you know a full value, it's moving through a hatching idea, through wavy lines. So these are all different kinds of continuity. And it's the same shape, so it's kind of variations on a theme again. That's what continuity is, basically. So this painting I showed in the first composition lecture is it's basically you're seeing this same shape spin and twirl through space and there's a continuity there so there's a theme the ballerina shape and then a variations on the theme the ballerina is doing an arabesque the ballerina is getting prepared to do something the ball ballerina is leaning up against the wall or whatever it is okay so most people can read this paragraph it says according to research cambridge university it doesn't matter in which order the letters in a word are the only important thing is that the first and last letters are in the right place okay you get it but the the idea here is that if as long as the first and last letters are the same and it has the same letters we we'll chunk it and we'll see these words together and we can read it even though every single word on here is misspelled Okay, so closure, that's a little hint about what it is. Closure is the mind's inclination to connect fragmentary information. Okay, so these are examples. So kind of simple visual examples. This one, there's no triangle here, but we'll read a triangle. There's really just three pack men or pack women talking to each other. This one, there's no shape here that's blocking these two things. It's just two separate commas or whatever these shapes are, but it looks like there's some kind of a, a rod in between them. This one, there's no circle, there's no um, sphere here. It's just a bunch of shapes, but because they feel like they're wrapping around something, we close it out in our minds and we see the sphere. This is kind of a Loch Ness Monster type phenomenon where it's really just three separate shapes, but we kind of see it as the same shape uh, coming up from the water, or coming up from a, something that's blocking it. Okay, so this is an everyday example of closure. So just look at this horse for a second. Of course, it's kind of digitized, but even I've seen this painting in person, this Degas painting. And even in the painting itself, so just look at this little area of this horse. It It's hard to, if you just had this part, it'd be hard to tell what this is, okay? This is a form of closure. When you put it in the entire picture, we immediately recognize that's a horse because we've got other horsey things going on over here. But when we just look at it by itself, we can't tell. So that's kind of an everyday kind of form of closure that happens in art all the time. You can get away with leaving something kind of ambiguous if you spelled it out in another place or it's part of a larger context. Okay, this a lot of uh, illusions based on closure. So she's just walking on the sidewalk, but because there's a spray painted shape on the ground, it looks like she's tipping a cube over. Or this one, this is just painted on the sidewalk, but if you take the picture from the right spot, we can't help but see this snake rising up. So this also, this is commonly in the news, actually, if you, like, it seems like every couple of years there's some story like this is, this woman thought she saw Jesus and a piece of toast. Uh, this is the face from Mars. This is closure because these are random events, but we'll see, we'll turn them into something that makes sense to us socially, like a face, something that is something about our social world. Okay, there's a cat with a... Hood. Okay, see you next time.